have information on the slides and the recording. Okay, our presenter today uh, is also uh, a fairly new columnist for Quality Digest. His, his articles have been very well received. Uh, this is Dr. Gleb Siforsky, an internationally recognized thought leader known as the disaster avoidance expert. Gleb's mission is to um, protect leaders from dangerous judgment errors based on cognitive biases by helping them develop the most effective decision-making strategies. He's also the best-selling uh, author of several books, uh, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. Also the book, The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships. And finally, Resilience, adapt and plan for the new abnormal of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. Uh, okay, Gleb, it's all yours, go ahead. Thank you so much for that introduction, Dirk. And thank you all for tuning in to check out this presentation. I hope it will help you adapt and plan successfully for the pandemic and the post-pandemic recovery. Without further ado, let's talk about how we got into this mess in the first place. So, we had lots of major public figures who made very bad decisions around COVID-19. And I'm not going to go into politics, although there's certainly stuff there, but in business, there were very many figures who made very bad decisions. Consider Elon Musk. He's, the, of course, the founder of Tesla, SpaceX. A lot of quality professionals work at these manufacturing firms. Now, what did he do? What did he say about the pandemic? On March 6, as the pandemic was taking root here in the United States, it was growing more and more widespread, he tweeted that the coronavirus panic is dumb. And he's one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful in terms of being listened to entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. So that tweet had 1.7 million likes. And just a few, couple of weeks later, on March 19th, notice this is after the declaration of the emergency here in the US, which is on March 16th, he tweeted that based on current cases, probably close to zero new cases in the US, by the end of April. <laughs> Obviously, he was mistaken. We have over two, we have more than two million cases by now, and it's not looking like we'll have less. So he's very mistaken. So this, and he represents a lot of entrepreneurs who made a lot of bad decisions around the pandemic. A lot of people listen to him. He's very popular. So that's new money, entrepreneurs, Silicon Valley, startups. What about maybe more conservative institutions, old money, people who go to you know, listen to those financial analysts at places like Goldman Sachs? What, do, what did Goldman Sachs have to say about the pandemic? So one of the things that Goldman Sachs does, of course, is as part of its analysis, make estimates of US GDP growth, which is very important for their clients and more broadly for their credibility. And a lot of people these are more old money folks, you know, Ford compared, you know, you look at Ford and General Motors compared to Elon Musk, and of course, all other sorts of you know, older industrial manufacturing firms where a lot of quality professionals work. So, made estimate that by February, on February 24th, they made an estimate that US GDP growth in the second quarter will only be 2.7%. And this was lower than their previous estimate because of the COVID-19 pandemic. On March 15th, they amended their estimate. So this is three weeks. Let's see what the change is. They said it's a 5% decline. So 5% decline. So change of 7.7% lower GDP growth over three weeks. That's a huge difference. That's a major difference. Clearly, they were screwed up the first estimate. But let's see what happened only five days later on March 20th. They made another revision to their estimate of 24% decline. 24% decline, That's a, uh, that is a difference of 19%. So clearly they screwed up and a lot of people listened to them. So this was foundational for the kind of bad decisions that accompanied the way that companies were dealing with the pandemic in the beginning. Lots of leaders were very unprepared very unprepared for the pandemic. They very much underestimated the threat, whether they listened to Elon Musk or Goldman Sachs or many other folks like them. And by the way, Elon Musk and Goldman Sachs are still underestimating the pandemic even to this day. They were caught unprepared and they are still being caught unprepared even right now. And they turned to their emergency business continuity plans. Now, I'm someone, my expertise, as Dirk mentioned, is in disaster avoidance, decision making. So I help companies with their business continuity plans, disaster preparedness plans all the time. But 
what I have to tell you right now, you know, is this is not a good time for the traditional business continuity plan. They are not a good fit for the situation because they are meant for emergencies. They're great for emergencies. Like let's say if there is a blizzard, you know, and snowed out or something like that, or major flood, let's say when Houston got flooded, that's a one to two week business interruption. That's what business continuity plans are for. They're great for that, but they're not great for things like COVID-19. It's not your typical emergency. It's a major disruptor. It's a long-term major disruptor, slow moving, high impact, long-term train wreck. And our minds, our brains are not well adapted to dealing with these marathon-like dangers, with these marathon-like disruptors. It's a marathon and not a sprint. And relying on these business continuity plans is very problematic. So you should not be doing that and you should not be advising the, your leaders to do that. So let's talk about how do we get out of COVID-19? How do we deal with COVID-19? You've probably heard, we, this has been, you know, if you haven't been in a cave for a long time, that vaccine is our only way of dealing with COVID-19. So vaccine, we have treatments, we're developing treatments, but those treatments look, they seem like they're only slightly effective. So remdesivir, You've probably heard about that. It seems like it shortens hospital stay time and maybe slightly decreases mortality. There are other treatments that are coming out that also do some of the same things and they are impactful for the sickest people, but they're not really that significant. They maybe decrease your chance of dying by 10%, by 20%, not that much. It's good, but you know, not that much. So. Vaccine is the only effective solution. That is the only effective solution. Now, you want to have to understand that human trials for the vaccine, you've probably heard a number of times about the Moderna vaccine, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the Gilead vaccine. All of those are prepared already, but then the problem is testing them, human trials. So human trials take, they have to test the safety of the effectiveness and the, the safety of the vaccine and the effectiveness of the vaccine separately. And it will take at least a year to do that, as opposed to the usual four to five years. So you've probably heard that, you know, we can have a vaccine maybe as early as the beginning of 2021. That's if everything goes perfectly. So let's talk about the timelines. We have to understand that most vaccines, they don't make it for human trials. This is especially the case for early, for vaccines that are rushed into production as the COVID-19 vaccines were. So of course, the first batch of vaccines, the ones that are entering trials right now or have entered them a couple of months ago, they were rushed very much into production and they were based on the initial version of COVID-19. Now, there was a study published in Cell, very prestigious peer-reviewed, highly credible study uh, several weeks ago that showed that COVID-19 recently mutated into a different form that was that's much more infectious. It's not more deadly, but it's much more infectious and it has become the main form of COVID-19 that's spreading for the US, for Europe and around the world. Not everywhere, but the, this is the major form of COVID-19. It's much more infectious than the original form of COVID-19, if you can imagine that. And some of these, and we don't know whether the vaccines that were originally created for the old form of COVID-19, the original form, whether they'll be effective for this new one. They might be, they might not be, because what mutate, what those vaccines are targeting is the spike protein on COVID-19. And the spike protein is what mutated on this new version. So we really don't know. So it's unlikely that the first trials will be successful, just realistically speaking. And now after the vaccine is ready, what will need to happen is that the government will need to create the production, coordinate the production, distribution, and vaccination. Now, the government has not shown much competence so far, unfortunately, at least the federal government level, in, in managing the production of testing, managing the production of PPE, personal protective equipment, ventilators, or its distribution. So I wouldn't be very highly optimistic about the production distribution capacity of the government. And then vaccination, that's going to be really difficult. We have surveys showing that only 50% of the population are ready to take a vaccine. And you know, this will be a big, big challenge. So we should not be optimistic about the government's ability to do that because this will all have to take place after approval of the vaccine. So let's talk about timelines. And this is for you to think about as quality professionals, what you're going to tell your leaders, how are you going to prepare them for the situation? We have an optimistic timeline, a moderate timeline, and a pessimistic timeline. 
optimistic. It'll be approved for mass production by summer 2021. We're assuming that it will will have super good luck. You know, we'll uh, roll 12. We'll roll 20. You know, 12s on you know on throwing the dice, and then we, this again very low likelihood. And then we'll have this vaccine by summer of 2021. And then production, distribution, vaccination, we're assuming a very high level of government competence. It will take only six months. So six months for, to produce, distribute, and vaccinate people. Then most people will be vaccinated by early 2022. And that's when we can really say that we have dealt with COVID-19. And that is super optimistic. You know, this is very optimistic. The probability is no more than 25% in this. I really would not bet on this. I think this is very unlikely, unfortunately. Now, the mother timeline. This is the timeline that's most likely to happen. So this is much more realistic. It'll be approved for mass production somewhere between you know, 20, late 20, end of 2021 and end of 2025. So by 2023 would be a midpoint for its approval. Then production, distribution, vaccination for a moderate level of government competence, somewhat higher than the initial government response to COVID-19, would be a year. Then most people will be vaccinated on average by 2024. So that's going to be the moderate timeline, somewhere a range between 2023, 2026. So that's kind of the range. 2024 is kind of a midpoint in that range. And I think this is 50%. Based on all the research, based on all the estimates and evaluations, this is the most likely scenario. So 50% of the worlds that we might live in in the future, this is going to be the world. But we might also get unlucky. This is the pessimistic scenario. It might it take a really long time for us to come up with an effective, safe vaccine. So we'll have it approved, let's say, by 2026. Then production, distribution, vaccination will take a year. So moderate level of government competence, and then most people will be vaccinated by 2027. This, I would say, 25% scenario, because it might be much more difficult to come up with a vaccine than we think. And you might think this is too cynical, but I don't know if you know that, but we still don't have a vaccine for the flu. We've been working on getting a vaccine for the flu for over a century, and we still don't have an effective vaccine for the flu. The one we, that we have is only 50% effective. And of course, COVID-19, so, you know, decreasing its lethality by 50% would still be very, very serious. I mean, imagine that we're, the, the Americans are dying. You know, we have over 120,000 dead so far. What if we had 60,000 dead? That would still be terrible. And people would still be scared to go out in the streets. And the economy would still be in dire straits. This is not a good situation. So 50% effectiveness of vaccine would not be good. So this is something that we need to address. We need to address the downside risk. And as quality professionals, you know that your most important job, realistically speaking, is addressing the downside risk. Of course, improving things. So we want to go to the optimistic scenario, but to really addressing the failures, addressing the downside risk is incredibly important. So this is not easy to hear. I mean, I have to say, when I first learned about this and I was studying about this topic and I was researching it, I was just struggling to hear this and accept this. And my clients, the ones I work with, so I'm the CEO of Disaster Avoidance Experts, and I do a lot of work on disaster avoidance, risk management, decision making, they struggled with it too. You know, I had to kick, you know, drag some of them kicking and screaming into the reality of the situation. And what really helps to, under, to accept it is realizing that the longer we go without accepting it, the longer we go without taking steps to address it, the worse off we will be, the more pain we will suffer. So that's what's something that really helps me and helps them. And I hope helps you accept this information and start dealing with it and especially addressing the downside risk. I mean, this is huge. So you, we want to understand the, what our future is until widespread vaccination. And by the way, this is something that's happening right now. And I predicted this in an article for Quality Digest already in March. So you can go back, see my articles, look at the one for March and look at my March articles and see that I already predicted that this is what's going to happen. We'll have looser restrictions. And we saw a number of states opening up and increasing cases. Then we'll have tighter restrictions. So we see a number of states closing down. And of course, that will lead to a decrease in cases. And guess what? We'll play whack-a-mole. <laughs> All of this, this will be repeating waves of lighter restrictions, tighter restrictions, looser, tighter, looser, tighter over the next several years until we get a vaccine. So we'll have to have various levels of social distancing, shutdowns, and so on 
until we have a vaccine. Unfortunately, because our government is not nearly as competent as the government in South Korea. I mean, South Korean government discovered COVID-19 in South Korea on the same day that it was discovered in the US. But by now, so, and South Korea has 60 million people, the US has 330 million people, 100,000 less by now. So 60 million people, by now, only th under 300 people died in South Korea. And in the US, over 120,000 died. So if, if our government was as competent as the government in South Korea, we'd have under 1,500 people dead. And that's because they do very good testing, contact tracing, and isolation. And without that, they would have had to do social distancing and shutdowns, but they're doing many, much less shutdowns, only in small limited regions, because they have a strong testing and isolation capacity. That's unfortunate, but this is the reality that we have to live with, with not a high level of government competence. This is not a short-term emergency, so this is something we have to realize. It's a major disruption, and it will, we will be dealing with it even in the most optimistic scenario until 2022. So this is something that we have to accept and realize. The world will change forever. Whatever happens, even if we roll 12s and we get very lucky, the, role will, the world will really change forever. We will have various waves of restrictions that we're having right now. They'll change people's habits, norms, values, expectations, risk appetites. We'll never go back to January 2020, that idyllic world before COVID-19. And this is something we have to accept. So your role as a trusted advisor, so as a quality professional, you're a trusted advisor to the leadership of your company, to the C-suite and so on. You're a trusted advisor, and your role is to help leaders, help these leaders who are tend to be way too optimistic, especially if they list, listen to people like Elon Musk or the analysts at Goldman Sachs deal and accept the extent of this major disruption. You have to help them prepare for this uncomfortable reality. And by doing so, you'll help them not only accomplish their leadership goals, which they'll of course be very grateful for, but also build trust in you as a trusted advisor. You know, the fact that I went to my clients and I told them that, hey, you have to prepare for waves of restrictions and loosenings, not everyone believed me, but you know, they took at least some steps to prepare for it. And believe me, they were very grateful in you know, starting last month when Florida, Arizona, Texas started seeing restrictions. And now Ohio and so many other states. I live in Columbus, Ohio, so go Bucks. <laughs> started seeing restrictions. And this is your role. So you, I want to encourage you to help your leaders and yourselves not plan for the optimistic scenario. That's too many companies are doing that. Hope is not a strategy. This is a good quote attributed to the famous football coach, Vince Lombardi, and I strongly encourage you to use some version of it, use the quote itself to talk to your leaders. They, they like sports quotes. Prepare for the moderate or pessimistic scenario. That's what I strongly encourage you to do. Now, let's talk a little bit about the neuroscience. So, of course, this is all based on the neuroscience of this topic and my expertise. I've spent over 15 years in academia as a cognitive neuroscientist and behavioral economist, and I have to tell you that we make very bad decisions about threats that are unusual, slow-moving, ones that we don't have experience with. That's because of how our brain is wired, partially due to our evolutionary background and our gut reactions, and that leads to decisions that really make major problems for our business. Let me tell you a little bit about my background so you know about the credibility I have to speak about this. So, talk about my experience. I've spent over 20 years helping clients as the CEO of disaster avoidance experts, consulting, coaching, and training on risk management, disaster avoidance, strategic planning, and decision making. So that's my areas of expertise. And I've spent 15 years in academia studying these topics, published in dozens of peer-reviewed venues, behavior and social issues, journal of social and political psychology. I spent, you know, I'm in Columbus, Ohio, because I spent seven years as a professor at Ohio State. So I know what I'm talking about. I have the academic background, and more importantly, I have the pragmatic business experience working with clients daily, helping them address these issues, in whether in areas related to quality management, of course, because it's disaster avoidance, risk management, strategic planning, and decision making. My clients. So my clients are very varied, ranging from entrepreneurial startups to Fortune 500 companies, and Fortune 500 companies ranging from Aflac to Xerox. So I've worked with a lot of companies. I know how companies run. I worked with a lot of manufacturing companies where a lot of quality professionals work. I here in the Midwest, so a lot of my clients are manufacturing as well as technology. So I know how that stuff works. Media. I've been featured in many media venues besides Quality Digest, of course. 
I've been featured in prominent venues like Inc., Time, CNBC, NPR, Newsweek, Scientific American, Fast Company, CBS News, and so on. So I have the thought leadership expertise and credibility. And finally, I published a number of best-selling books, and Dirk mentioned Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions to Avoid Business Disasters. That just talks about decision-making strategies, what you need to do to address good decisions, to make good decisions, so risk management, strategic planning. Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships. That's about relationships, communication, effective communi and relationship building, stakeholder management. The Truth Seekers Handbook, a science-based guide, how to help people realize uncomfortable truths like the one about COVID-19, help yourself and help others realize them and accept them. And finally, my newest book, and this is what this talk is based on. So if you're gonna get one book, check out this one. That's what the talk is based on, Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. Talks about how to adapt and to the current situation so that we can thrive in the pandemic and successfully plan for the recovery from the pandemic. And of course, I'll talk about the, how to do so throughout the rest of the talk. So, the neuroscience. Why is bad advice common? These dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases, that's why bad advice is common. That's why you get advice like Elon Musk and Goldman Sachs, which is very common and problematic, comes from our evolutionary background and the structure of our brain, those two factors. Our evolutionary background. Now, we lived as our gut reactions, our brain is wired for the savanna environment, not the modern environment. When we lived as human beings in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people, and we had to deal with threats that were immediate, intense in the moment. And this, so we developed the fight or flight response. That was great for hunters and gatherers, and that's our primary response to threats because the risks that they faced were like saber-toothed tigers. You might have heard of it as a saber-toothed tiger response. Unfortunately, the fight or flight response is very dangerous in today's world because the risks that we face are much more uncertain, are much more ambiguous. They're much more likely to come as a notification on your phone about a disease, an article about a disease somewhere in the middle of China that you don't know anything about. So this is the kind of threats that we face and we respond to these very badly because we're not wired to respond to them well. There are specifically three dangerous judgment errors, three cognitive biases that I want to highlight. The normalcy bias, the planning fallacy, and hyperbolic discounting. So that's what you want to especially avoid. The normalcy bias, we assume that everything will keep going normally. That was a safe assumption in the savanna environment. You know, the only change in the savanna environment would be the difference of the seasons. That's what was the case in the savanna environment. So we still think that the future will be mostly like today because we estimate the short-term, medium-term future based on the short-term, medium-term past. That is a very bad assessment in the modern environment. Think about the kind of disruptions that we're facing with technology. So a lot of technology disruptors recently. What about the fiscal crisis of 2008, 2009? And of course, COVID-19. This, it's not safe to assume that the future will be much like today, but our gut reaction is still to do so. And we underestimate both the possibility and the impact of major disruptors. This is something that you as quality professionals need to learn, internalize, and understand. It doesn't only apply to COVID-19, it applies to all sorts of problems. So normalcy bias. Planning fallacy, again, very important for COVID-19 and in general for quality professionals. We look at our plans and we think everything will go according to plan. We assume that the future will be just like we envision it because we feel good about ourselves and we feel good about our plans, That's especially the case for leaders. They tend to be way too optimistic about their plans. The, now, you might have heard the phrase that failing to plan is planning to fail. It's not a good phrase. It's pretty misleading, even though it's commonly used. A much better phrase that I teach my clients is failing to plan for problems is planning to fail. We don't plan for problems typically. That's not a way that we think about the future. But that's how we should think about the future, because we don't prepare enough for problems and risks, including unanticipated ones like COVID-19 and also ones that we can realistically anticipate. And as a result, and we can actually take steps to address unanticipated risks like COVID-19. I'll talk about that later in the presentation, as well as risks that we can realistically anticipate and don't. So we underestimate the resources that we need for the future that we need to do with time, money, information, social capital, and the kind of resources, these resources that we'll need to solve the problems and the risks that will come up. Finally, hyperbolic discounting. Important for quality professionals in all sorts of areas, especially COVID-19, relevant to COVID-19. 
we tend to, in the savannah environment, we needed to live for the moment. That was safe. We needed to see the short-term future as the most important thing because we couldn't gather up resources, you know, kill the mammoth, couldn't freeze the meat, you need to eat as much of the meat as possible right now, stuff yourself and that's all. That's how we can survive and thrive. So we are the descendants of those who did so. But, you know, you, what are you going to become? You couldn't invest in your professional development. You, what are you going to be a Baxter X chipper or something? Of course, we can do that now. We can invest in our careers, in our professional development. We can invest, save resources, put your money in a bank. And of course, organizations can invest into their long-term future. But we don't do nearly enough of that. We underestimate the importance of the long term. So that we underestimate the long term outcomes and impacts and prioritize the short term future way too much at the expense of the long term. These three cognitive biases are very important for dealing with COVID-19, for how we react badly to COVID-19, and in general for you as quality professionals for all sorts of areas. Now, how can you prepare? How can you prepare for COVID-19? You need to make long-term changes to your plans, not short-term ones. You want to think years, not weeks, literal years. Again, the most optimistic scenario is 2022, and it's very unlikely to occur to only 25%. How can you businesses prepare? You want to make fundamental changes to your business model for a future focused on virtual interactions. A lot of businesses are rushing to reopen too fast. I just published an article about this in Quality Digest. They're falling into the normalcy bias trap. They want, they think that the future will be normal. They think that COVID-19 was a blip of a few months and that we're back to normal. We're not, and these businesses are rush are heading straight into closings, shutdowns, restrictions. They're spending and wasting a lot, a lot of money on reopenings, and that's a very dangerous trend. That's a very dangerous problem for their bottom lines, and of course, for the health of their employees, because their employees are getting sick. One of the most common places where people are getting sick is in the office. It's because they spend a lot of time next to each other, and not everyone follows the mass guidelines. It's become so politicized. Anyway, so this is a big problem. You want to get as much virtual interactions for your business as possible, so you don't need to yo-yo. I strongly encourage all my clients and as many people as possible to make a commitment to virtual teams, virtual offerings for manufacturers, make all of their back end, all of their office workers virtual. Again, this is something doable for sir. I mean, service professionals can do this a lot. Quality professionals usually work in manufacturing firms and so on. There's less of that, but you can do a lot of that still that's not being done to reduce the risks, reduce the problems. You want to consider ending your office space lease. I've saved a lot of money for my clients who are really reluctant to end their office space lease, but I showed them that, hey, you know, you can, if you really want to keep your office space, you can reduce it by 90%. Just, you know, have one person in the office to take care of checks and paperwork and mail that goes in, and that's all. Ideally, you get rid of your office space altogether. I know it's only a two month, you break a contract that's only two months, you know, first month, last month, that's all pay it and then spend your time and your efforts on you know, virtual interactions and funding those. And of course, you can get co-working spaces as needed to, if you need to meet or something like that. So let's talk about changes. Internal business model first and external business model. There are six areas that you want to be thinking about in your internal business model that you want to change. Internal controls is the first. You want to ensure financial security. That's a basic, that's an obvious thing. But many people are don't, not doing that because it's not in their business plan, business continuity plan. <laughs> you know, business continuity plan, again, is for a one week to two week interruption. But for constant change, for transition to virtual, you need to change your approach to financial security. Similarly, your approach to cybersecurity. A lot more hacking is going on right now, successful hacking according to the FBI, because people aren't taking care of their cybersecurity. They're not used to following cybersecurity protocols at home. So that's a big issue. You need to give training to people. This is about training. Then you need to give them funding to harden their software and hardware. I mean, some people are, I mean, I, I, I've had senior executives who are not so technologically savvy do things like turn off their firewalls because they weren't able to access their proxy servers on their, on their computers, of the, the virtual computer at work. It's dumb, I know, but that's what happens. So you need to help people give them training and harden their, their computers at home and their software at home so that they know how to, so they have the appropriate software at home and hardware at home 
to do good virtual work. Adapt existing compliance practices. There are a bunch of compliance practices that have to be adapted to the virtual setting from cyberbullying and sexual harassment to a whole bunch of other areas. And of course, compliance with CDC guidelines if you do have in-office work, and especially for manufacturing firms, for mining, that you, of course, you need some in-person activity so that you want to have, you want to go above and beyond CDC guidelines, basically. There's some politicized political pressure on the CDC to not be as thorough in its guidelines as it should be. And we can talk about that in the Q&A. There's a number of studies showing that there's significant research that the CDC is not incorporating into its guidelines about how to have manufacturing be more safe and have mining and other sorts of things that you need to do in person be more safe. And finally, revise internal measurements. People aren't thinking about this nearly enough. Your measurements of effectiveness and efficiency are going to be different for virtual teamwork versus in-person teamwork. So you need to revise that. Motivation engagement. Now, already before the pandemic, and by the way, this, these are all areas that you're going to be talking about to your leadership and you might not be immediately able to impact these areas, but as a quality professional conveying this information to the leadership, you can make sure to address risks, downsides, and improve the quality both of the manufacturing, whatever the, the processes, but also the human beings, motivation, engagement, internal team culture. You want to bring this information to the leadership. Now, before the pandemic, Far from all employees were fully engaged according to Gallup surveys. Only 34% took initiative, were creative, willing to sacrifice for the company. Most people, over 50%, something like 59%, were not willing to do that. They were passive. They were just punching the club, doing barely enough to get by, not get fired, just doing the kind of bare minimum. And, you know, in the teens, 17% or so were actively hostile, to the actively disengaged, meaning hostile to the company, bad-mouthing it, looking for the first way out, so looking for a new position. That's not great for the working at home because, of course, working at home, we are not going to have the people around us who motivate us. A lot of research on cognitive biases, framing effects, what's called the framing effect, shows that our context, the frame that we have, really influences us. So the one of the reasons it's much harder to work at home is because you don't have others around you who are working the same way that you do, who are working in your company, who you can talk to, chat to. That makes it really hard. And that is a change in the environment that you can get people, you can support them. You can, there's funding for this. You can give them support for working at home effectively and especially taking care of all the headaches and, that are coming with the pandemic. I mean, a bunch of kids are home right now. They're not going to summer camps in some cases in areas with bigger outbreaks. And there's definitely some schools are going to be closed completely in some areas, you know, in California and so on, some other areas, New York, for then in the fall, which is in many ways unfortunate. I'm not going to go and get into a debate on whether schools should be open or closed. That's not my decision. This is a decision of politicians, but that's some, a reality that your company has to struggle with. So this is something that you can provide support and guidance to your employees for. Next, effective communication. You know, it's already hard to communicate face to face, but it's especially hard to communicate virtually for people who are used to office to in office interaction. That virtual communication is difficult because it's mainly textual. It's written communication. So people are switching from chatting to each other to things like Microsoft Teams, Trello, Slack, Asana, Mondays, whatever software that you use, they're switching to these sorts of software and you're having mainly textual interactions and you're losing a lot. You're losing a lot of these emotional cues that people take, that people use to understand exactly what you're saying. When they say something like, I think Michael should take that project versus I think Michael should take that project, those two sentences mean very different things. However, when I write them down, they mean the same thing because you lose the tone of voice and you lose body language, you lose your expressions. That creates a lot of communication trouble, a lot of problems, lots of misunderstandings. Fortunately, there's training that you can do and it's essential to train your employees in effective virtual communication. Rel related to this, but not the same thing, is resolving conflicts. Now, in face-to-face -face interactions, you can sense problems, notice them and resolve them much more easily. If you, this is about body language, for example. If you notice in face-to-face -face interactions that somebody is, seems anxious, worried, confused, scared, angry, 
you can address that in the moment and resolve these sorts of problems, you know, body tone, posture, you can resolve them in the moment, but you can't do that in written communication. So you're going to have a lot more trouble even noticing conflicts, but you're also going to have a lot of trouble resolving them because of the communication issues I mentioned before. So this is another area that's critically important to train employees on. This is something that's doable for training. So far, we've talked about training for internal control, cybersecurity, communication, resolving conflicts, cultivating trust. This is not about training. Now, in office settings, it's very natural and intuitive to cultivate trust by just chatting to each other about the local sports ball team, what uh, you're having a, for what vacation you had, what your kids are doing. You meet over the water cooler in the break room and you talk about that stuff. I mean, it's easy, it's simple, it's fun, it's engaging, but you don't do that virtually, of course. You don't have that opportunity. It's, you, you, that's not what you do. Fortunately, you can create this, these sort of artificial ways that people can interact with each other. This is not a matter of training. You need to create venues for doing so. We can talk in the Q&A about this. And again, you can put in your questions about this right now into the Q&A box. Finally, accountability. Now, accountability is much easier in in-person settings. Because if you're a supervisor, you can walk around, see who's doing what, check in with them in the moment, see if they seem worried, disengaged, anxious, address that. And you can have peer-to-peer -peer accountability. You know, you pop into Michael's office and say, hey, Michael, where's that report that you promised me on the project that <laughs> you, you should take? Well, you know, Michael will have a much harder time ignoring you when you're in the doorway to his office than when you send a Slack message about this. So you need to create new structures for accountability. It has to be accountability up the chain of command and peer-to-peer -peer accountability. And we can talk about this in the Q&A, what kind of structures I've, I've helped a lot of companies do this. So let's talk about external business model. There are also six areas in external business model. Service delivery is the obvious first one. You want to transition to virtual or at least socially distanced offerings. And there's new research on how to do social distancing that the CDC has not incorporated into its guidelines. We can talk about that. But the CDC, again, is under some political pressure to not have the most effective social distancing guidelines. That's pretty dangerous for operations like mining, various sorts of manufacturing, uh, ag agricultural processing that quality professionals work in. So some will find it easier than others to do social distancing, you know, to do virtual, of course, if you do office work, it's much easier to do it virtually, but you can also be creative. You know, I do training, consulting and coaching, and I've switched all of that to, so, to virtual. And I can do everything that I could, especially in consulting, because there are some shadowing observations that I can't do, but you can still do most. I can still do most of what I did before. For some businesses, I have to say the best thing to do is close it. Right now, I've said that from the beginning. I've said it in the article for, for Quality Digest in March that things like bars and restaurants are not, not, not going to deal well with COVID-19. If you're in that business, I strongly encourage you to get out of that business. I helped a number of coaching clients get out of that business. This is not a good time to be in this business. And you're going to have waves of restrictions and shutdowns. Bars, restaurants already have a very low profit margin. You don't want to be in that business. Some entertainment venues, you don't want to be in that business. Sorry. Relationships. So this is another area of professional training. You want to get training for external stakeholders, how to establish new relationships and how to cultivate existing ones virtually. External stakeholders of all sorts, your clients, of course, your service providers, political leaders are especially important right now with the amount of money flowing out of Washington. Incredibly important to have virtual effective interactions with political leaders, prospects, investors, suppliers and so on. This is professional development territory. You want to do training on this topic and it's very doable. Then you want to think about managing disruptions. Now, you are all more savvy now that you've checked out this webinar and seen what are you actually dealing with with COVID-19, how long it will last, how bad it will be, the waves of restrictions and loosenings, the cognitive biases that you have to face. But a lot of your external stakeholders are not watching this webinar and are not nearly as savvy as you. They won't prepare for the long-term impact of the pandemic. So you need to make plans to protect yourself from their failures. And this is another really important thing that to convey to your leaders. All of this is important, but this is especially important to convey. 
the things like supply chains is an obvious one, but service delivery and so on, clients will be screwing up. You want to protect yourself from their failures. Shifting norms. Think about how all of these norms will shift. We'll talk, we talked about all the shifting norms of expectations, habits, risk appetites, desires. You want to try to get ahead of these norms. Think about where in your industry, whatever you're doing, where the norms will be in a couple of years after we're dealing with COVID-19 and get ahead of these norms, get ahead of these shifts so that you can successfully position yourself for the recovery from the pandemic. Unknown unknowns. Now, COVID-19 was a predictable disaster. A number of people were predicting it, people as prominent as Bill Gates. But of course, a lot of people didn't see it. They didn't anticipate it. They didn't listen to Bill Gates. It was a kind of a Cassandra complex. You want to scan your environment for major potential disasters like COVID-19. You know, there are a number of things going on right now from global warming caused things like the dust storm from the Sahara. I mean, who knew, right? But that caused a lot of problems for the Southwest, the, for, that, the, for the South, Southwest, Southeast. That was pretty problematic. And you can do, you can scan your environment for a lot of potential disasters like this. You know, just because we're dealing with COVID-19 doesn't mean that other things won't come, whether pandemics or other sorts of things. You want to protect yourself against them, and there are ways of doing so that you can think about risks, plans, and problems. Now, some things you can't really predict for, just you can't really predict. You can't protect yourself against them by predicting and looking at your environment. But what you can do is, of course, have a cash cushion in reserve because cash will always be helpful. And of course, if the disaster doesn't happen, you can always invest it in something else. Then, this is something that the leaders you talk to will be especially excited about, outcompeting your competition. The steps I shared, if you take them, you'll gain a major competitive advantage. The company you are with will gain a major competitive advantage at a time when many of your competitors, they'll fail to adapt to the pandemic, they'll start stumbling. This is an opportunity to get ahead of them. You'll wanna seize their market share, hire good, away good employees. This is a great opportunity. Finally, let's talk about the long-term planning. So. We, there are six areas again, so 666 for potential, oh, I didn't mean to make it like the devil's number, <laughs> plan for the long-term impact of the pandemic. So six areas, possible future. So think about a variety of possible futures. We talked about the optimistic one, the pessimistic one, and the moderate one. And you wanna invest your resources accordingly to all of these different futures, whether vaccine by 2022, 24, 27, and whatever applies to your individual industry and company, of course. Then think about five years out. Where will you be in each of these futures? What would your business look like in each of these scenarios? Think about it and help your leaders think about it. The optimistic scenario, the moderate scenario, and the pessimistic one. What will your business look like? What will the environment look like? What will the social dynamics, the shifts look like? How can you get ahead in each of these scenarios of the social shifts? Think about the problems that you'll have in each of these scenarios and list them. You know, whether supply chains, disruptors, clients, prospects, whatever. Think of the ways that you can address them in advance. So maybe you can localize your supply chains or something like this. Make a plan to resolve issues if they do occur. So you can take some steps now to address them and you can take some steps to make a plan to address them others if they occur so that you're not running around like a chicken without your head relying on business continuity plans that are not a good fit for the situation. Then think about opportunities. There are many opportunities that you can seize, and this is something that business leaders especially are excited about in each of these scenarios. So for example, you can bring about these opportunities. If you think that your competitor will stumble, which is very likely to be the case, one of the things that I'm having a lot of companies that I'm working with do, it's having their sales team go to Client, go to prospects who are currently working with competitors and say, hey, here are steps I've taken from A to F to be pandemic proof. Now, I know that my competitor hasn't taken these steps and I've invested a lot of resources into taking these steps. And if my competitor happens to stumble on this pandemic, I will be glad to provide you with services if you would like me to. And you know what? They'll be glad to, they will keep your number just in case and they'll call you because, you know, insurance, right? Hedging their bets. This is something that you can do right now, that your leaders can do right now, that your companies can do right now. 
resources. Think about the resources that you'll need in each of these scenarios. Money, time, information, social capital, whatever. Strategic planning, take the time to do that. And make a plan to reserve sufficient resources for the pessimistic scenario. Really pessimistic scenario. I mean, at least the moderate one. If your company is a mid-sized one, doesn't have the resources for the pessimistic one, at least the moderate scenario. At least until 2024. But don't plan for the optimistic scenario. Don't plan for 2022. It's just very unlikely. All right, so think about the information that will help you determine which of these scenarios is taking place. The optimistic one, the moderate one, the pessimistic one. So the new study from Cell that came out just a couple of weeks ago that I mentioned helped me see, helped move my evaluation to see that the moderate scenario is more likely than the optimistic one. I mean, previously it was uh, the balance was something like a third of a third for the optimistic one and a third for the moderate one. Well, um, no, it was more like 40, 40%, 40% and 20%. And with this new study from Cell, I shifted my evaluations to 25, 50, 25. So that's how you want to be thinking about things. Look at the information that you're getting and adjust your plans accordingly. And then execute, execute, execute. All right. So that's the end of the presentation. Now, if you want any additional resources on this topic, go to tinyurl.com forward slash D event. There's a manual on effective strategic planning in the context of the pandemic and more broadly, and two chapters from my new book, Resilience, Adapt and Plan for the New Abnormal of the COVID-19 Coronavirus Pandemic. Again, at tinyurl.com slash D dash event. I'll be happy to take your questions right now. Hey, thanks, Gleb. Um, and actually, uh, before we get to the Q, uh, the Q and A, uh, just want to launch a little poll here uh, for anybody out there. Uh, if you want more information from our sponsor, Intellex, uh, just answer yes or no, and I'll just go ahead and leave this up. Uh, I'll leave that poll up. Um, okay, let's get to the Q and A. Um, so, William wants to know: at the very beginning, you talked about kind of this blind following of business leaders. You mentioned uh, Goldman Sachs, you mentioned Elon Musk, and, and there's others. Uh, William wants to know why do we blindly fall business and political leaders? There's a cognitive bias called emotional contagion. So emotional contagion has to do with when we see someone as an authority figure, when we see someone as a leader, as a role model, we are we are literally infected by their emotions, by their perceptions, by their values. So there, it's sort of an alignment. And if you think of the tribal background, in the tribal background, it was very important for us to have the status boundaries. So the person at the top, the alpha monkey in the room, that person was incredibly important and we looked up to this person because this person, overwhelmingly he in that sort of context, he determined our ability to survive and our social status in the tribe. So right now, a lot of people are simply emulating that. They're going with their gut reactions and they're following who, whoever they perceive to be the alpha monkey in the room, whether that's Goldman Sachs because of the extensive money, their pedigree, their expertise, for people who are old money, like I said, you know, the Ford to the Tesla, or the Tesla, the new money, the entrepreneurs, Silicon Valley, so Elon Musk, whoever they perceive to be their leaders, they are infected by their values, by their perceptions, by their beliefs, and they feel these similar emotions. It's hard to address that until you help people realize that, hey, here are the cognitive biases that we tend to fall into. And it's pretty dangerous to do that. This person, Elon Musk or Goldman Sachs, has been clearly wrong about this issue. So let's see how we can protect ourselves and hedge our bets and address the downside risk with COVID-19 or other areas. Talking about addressing downside risk and, of course, talking about how to competing your competition is really helpful, I find. Um this was kind of uh, this question just came in, which is interesting. Maybe you don't feel, tell me if you, whether you feel comfortable answering it or not. You've been basically speaking to, to people in the United States. Uh, this person is from India. Um, huh? What is your advice for developing economies like India, which are going through the same thing? I've actually spoke, speak to people in developing economies as well. Not so much India, but countries in Latin America. So I have more contacts with countries in Latin America. And there's a lot of similarities, obviously, between the developing countries. I'm not quite as familiar with the context in India, but I strongly encourage 
very similar things in terms of virtual, what you can do. Uh, your, what's under your control is virtual interactions. The kind of policies that the government takes have to be a little bit different because the dynamics of developing countries and their capacities, the state capacity is less than in countries that are developed. That's one of the big differences is state capacity. So the state capacity, the state is less able in developing countries to do shutdowns and social distancing. So there, there is, it, it's better in those sorts of areas to do more guidelines rather than restrictions because the restrictions, the sh if you shut things down, there will be a lot of people who try to escape through into the shadow economy and so on and there will be more trouble. So there's some more tension around that. But what you can do for your company, whatever company you're working in and whoever you can advise and influence is encourage them to understand and appreciate the real serious dangers of COVID-19. And of course, not everyone in India accepts that and believes that. And then do virtual interactions, as much virtual interactions as possible, social distancing. This is something to really invest into and spend money on, even though it's uncomfortable, but there, it, this is a really serious issue that needs to be done. Okay. Um, Chris wants to know, thinking about cybersecurity and the increase in attacks, would the near future, three to 12 months, be a wise time for a small company to invest in uh, things like a cloud-based electronic quality management system or other cloud-based uh, uh, softwares. Absolutely. This is a really good time for that. I think this is something for you to, the cloud-based, you, you're not going to use your own servers, you're going to use cloud-based uh, stuff, and this is going to be really good for teamwork, for collaboration. It Cloud-based services are for quality management are much better for virtual interaction than ones that are not cloud-based. So I'd strongly encourage that and support that. So that, that's, that's a good idea. And you want to align that, of course, with cybersecurity protocols. So you don't want to simply move to that because you're going to be opening up yourself somewhat to more danger if you simply move to that. But if you make that in alignment with various cybersecurity protocols and training, then you're going to be in a better position. Okay. Uh, I'm going to lump two questions together here because to me they're kind of related. Um, so Sharif asked, uh, what is the prerequisite for this approach? or is it applicable for all cases? And I'm gonna lump that together with, because I think you're related, how can we get leadership buy-in hmm. on implementing these strategies? Because it seems to me you have to have that first before you do anything else. Okay, so the first, so the first part of the question about application, this is really applicable to all cases, except ones that are directly under shutdowns like bars, restaurants. For those areas, I mean, I'm just going to be frank with you. If you work in companies like that, I would suggest that you leave those companies. I, I helped a number of my, uh, three of my clients who were in the C-suites of companies that were restaurants, bars, entertainment venues, leave those companies and go work in better sectors because those are not good sectors to work in right now. You know, So that's, that, that, that's sort of a separate issue. But for all other areas, you can, pretty much all companies can get their office workers now, the large majority of their office workers maybe leave one, two in the office. You ideally no more than one because of the risk of infection. So this one person will not infect others. And uh, you can have one person there at a time to deal with paperwork and so on. So you can move your back office to all, all areas. Absolutely. I can, I can guarantee this. I've worked with a lot of diverse companies that have been successful. And of course, for the things that you can't move, social distancing for things like agricultural processing, things like mining, things like chemicals, various production, manufacturing, those things can be socially distanced, but they have to be done so in a smart way and in a way that goes beyond CDC guidelines for, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, that the, some of the CDC guidelines are politicized in such a way as to not reflect the most recent research because it would be problematic from the political perspective and I can talk more about that. So that's kind of a, you can do that in all companies, literally. 
That's, so that's the first part of the question. Getting leadership buy-in. So getting leadership buy-in re- depends on helping your leaders understand the long-term outcomes. That's the first thing. That, that is what I talk about to leaders uh, as the first thing. Talk about, hey, here, the long-term outcomes are going to be in real danger. Talk about the risks, the downside. Think about, co- combine talking about the long-term outcomes with the downside. You know, think about the risks. What are the dangers? What are the problems? You know, what if your employees start getting sick? This is, thing is spreading. It's getting more widespread. Not a hoax. It's really becoming more and more problematic. And what if there's shutdowns in our area? We'll have to go back home. How much will it cost? Talk about the bottom line of shutdowns. You know, if offices are shut down and they will be in some areas that are getting worse and worse, then how much will that cost you to keep yo-yoing your team back and forth? How much disruption will that be? How much productivity will that cost? That'll be really dangerous. So talking about the direct costs involved, then the long-term outcome, talk about how, you know, if this thing will be around until 23, 24, 25, how will we deal with it? We're not in a, the vast majority, not the vast, I would say the, the majority of companies, I'm not sure about the vast majority, I haven't talked to the vast majority, but the majority of companies from what I've seen, so over 50% are currently treating COVID-19 like it will be over by the end of the year. Th- that's literally what they're doing. They're treating it as though it will be over by the end of the year. They're not incorporating it in their strategic plans. They're not pivoting. They're just thinking that, hey, it'll be over, it'll be soon. So helping them understand that the long term, you need to shift and pivot to address the situation. And talking about the downside, the risks, what are the problems that are going to be facing you for disruptions, for major disruptions from your clients, from your prospects, from your suppliers, service providers, all of those sorts of things. Helping them understand those long-term outcomes. And talking about that, then having so the stick is the first thing, you know, understanding the pain points. You don't start with the carrot, but the stick is the first thing, the pain points. Then the carrot, talk about how competing in the competition. That really resonates. So I found that to be you know, after they're down, after they're kind of sad and dealing with the problems, talk about the upsides, talk about the opportunities, talk about our competing your competition, that if they take these steps right now, make these shifts right now, they'll be much better positioned than their competitors as the pandemic goes forward. And realistically speaking, you know, based on these recent research, most likely we will not be in the optimistic scenario, most likely the moderate scenario. So they'll be much better positioned than their competitors and they'll seize market share. And that gives them hope and it gives them a vision, gives them inspiration. And it's something that they can use to inspire others. So you don't want to simply talk about the pain points. That's the first part to start in because you know they won't listen to you if they don't feel the pain, but then you want to give them hope and optimism and promise. Okay, and <clears throat> final question here. Um, we're almost at the end of our time here. Um, Managing a, a, an office or a pr- production environment that has people there where you're manager, you're on the floor and all that is different than managing a virtual office where the manager doesn't necessarily see, they can't walk up behind you and look over your shoulder, see what you're doing. Uh, so this is gonna be a big change for, for managers and how to manage virtual employees. What is your recommendation uh, to help those managers manage better when they can't physically be there with their employees. So I mentioned about the accountability structure. So I think that's the first step and the first and fundamental step. The accountability structure is incredibly important. You want to create a structure that will hold employees accountable and that will be transparent for both the manager and the employees and for others in the team. So what I've done for companies is when let's say there's a team, so manager and eight people, manager and eight people, let's say you're working in Microsoft Teams and you have a channel. So as part of a channel, what you do is every week as a manager, you have each team member write up a report of what they've been doing for that week. So what they've been doing, what they've been focusing on, their challenges, what they feel they can improve, what they plan to be focusing on next week. So that's something that you can do that you can write up with specific measurable deliverable outcomes as part of it you want very specific measurable deliverable outcomes for last week 
and evaluation of how you did against the specific measurable outcomes for last week, for the previous week. And in a way, there's more ways to track that when you're doing things virtually than when you've been doing things in the office for things like CRM and so on. So there, there are ways of tracking certain things. But of course, you know, sales, you can do phone calls and so on. So there are ways of tracking these things. So tracking these things, that's part, that's the, uh, that's the chain of command accountability. The other part is the peer-to-peer -peer accountability. Now, all of these, all of these software forms, whether Slack, Microsoft Teams, Trello, have ways of tagging other team members. So as part of the report, you tag other team members who you collaborated with in the week and describe how well you've collaborated, what they've done well, what they can improve, and so on. So you want to tag the number of people that you worked with, but you, at least one person, because you know if you're a team, you very likely work with other people. So you, that's part of the report, and that provides peer-to-peer -peer accountability. So that provides the you know Michael, uh, where's that report you promised me when you're standing in the doorway? You know because the, obviously the manager can see it, and everyone in the team can see it. So everyone can see each other's reports, and that's part of the dynamic. And of course, you as the manager will provide feedback to the employee. Some of it can be public, some of it can be private, that's your feedback, but the report needs to be transparent and public so that everyone sees what everyone is doing. So that is something that's incredibly helpful that provides that accountability that is missing from virtual teams. And again, there are various softwares that you can use like CRMs and so on to track what people are doing, but some of these things, of course, you won't be able to track. So that's the that accountability mechanism, I find, is the first and fundamental step. And all of those other things that I mentioned, the training in effective communication and training in how to resolve problems are going to be really important for you as a manager to address communication issues, problem solving issues as part of this holding people accountable and ensuring that your team functions together effectively in that in that virtual setting. And you know, I wanted to uh, you admit, and this is just a kind of a personal observation. Um, Quality Digest has had a virtual office now for two years at least, and mm. at least uh, half of the office has been virtual for much longer than that. Um, and you mentioned kind of the water cooler chat and you know how people keep in contact and stuff. Um, we've actually kind of fallen into that using our we don't use uh, we don't use Slack. We use something called Discord, but it's a live chat and we're on it all day. And we actually end up every day, probably two or three times a day, we'll end up falling into some sort of five minutes worth of just back and forth. Hey, I'm making this recipe tonight. Oh, what's your <laughs> recipe? You know, you'll end up swapping recipes or nice. sharing jokes. And it, it, it has kind of become the chat version mm -hmm. of the water cooler chat. And we don't discourage it because it yeah. really does kind of provide a five or 10 minute break sometimes just to kind of just chat with the other people about something completely random. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the same as in person, but it actually is effective. And I, I think yeah. not to discourage that for managers might say all my, all my uh, not ours, but some managers might say, what are you guys doing all this chat? You guys mm -hmm. spent 15 minutes talking about how to make pot roast or, you know, <laughs> you know what's, but it, it actually is valuable because then you, mm -hmm. you kind of step away from that. And now you go back to work. You've had your kind of like mental break chatting with your friends. Um, and I think it's valuable. Yeah. I, that yeah. would be advice to managers as well, I think. Absolutely. It's, that's great advice. And uh, I do something similar with companies where there's a venue, any sort of venue, whether Discord, on Slack, you can have a channel, same thing in Microsoft Teams, on Trello, you can have a card, where what you do is you have that autonomy where people can, whoever wants to, can share about anything in their lives. And that creates a human connection, that cultivation of trust. So what you're talking about, that mental break, and I think what may you, you didn't mention it, I don't know if you're kind of cognizant of that, but it also builds up that human relationship, that trust, the cultivation of trust and collaboration. Because you, know, you talk about pot roast and you trust this person more because they are human to you. <laughs> they are more right. human to you, you have that connection. So that's one thing, you have that autonomy. But you should also, in addition to that, and this is something that's important and valuable, create an obligatory structure. What I have people do is, again, using the same sort of channel, is create a morning check-in about how your day is going, how you're feeling, 
what you've done, what you last, you know, that, that you had fun with, something about you that most team members don't know, kind of a fun fact, and then just what you plan to work on that day. And then responding to three other team members who shared the same thing in the morning. That creates an obligatory kind of connection. So you, that's an obligatory thing, and that takes, you know, five minutes or so, five, ten minutes in the morning. And that's kind of your morning check-in. And then if you want to, that's the autonomy is for you to share whatever you want on a channel separately from that. Yeah, uh, interesting. Well, this was, uh, this was really good, Gleb. I, I appreciate your, uh, your taking the time today. Very interesting. Um, gotten some good feedback, really solid. Uh, one person said, um, straightforward without any fluff. Uh, I agree 100%. You were right to the point. Really good presentation. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all of you as well for joining us. Uh, there will be an email that will go out tomorrow that will have a link to a recording of the webinar. Um, I'm not sure, do you actually have a slide deck you can send us? Well, I don't really need it because the slides are on the screen. So there you go. The recording, yeah. everything that Gleb shared is going to be on the screen. Uh, so you don't need a separate slide deck. It's all right there in front of you. So um, keep your eyes open. That email will go out sometime tomorrow, probably around the same time frame. And you'll be able to go back and <clears throat> watch this video again or share it with your friends, hopefully. Uh, and that is it. So uh, thanks, uh, Gleb. Thanks uh, to Intellix, our sponsor. Thanks to all of you for joining us. And we will see you at the next webinar. So long. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.